going to uh, present you an uh, incentivization model for uh, asymmetrical peer-to-peer -peer protocols, uh, uh, client-server uh, relationship-like protocols, uh, more specifically, uh, like client protocols. Uh, talking about the uh, light clients, uh, most uh, people usually think about uh, end user use cases and very lightweight use cases. And uh, uh, I believe in the near future, as we work, work towards scalability, uh, even our uh, core network uh, protocols and uh, systems will depend more and more on uh, some kind of light client protocols or asymmetrical protocols. So, having a reliable solution for incentivizing them is really important. Uh, so I've been working on a uh, model that is uh, capable of uh, long-term uh, trust building between uh, clients and servers in a totally decentralized and trustless environment and, uh, and can uh, is, is incentivize uh, uh, predictably service availability and uh, consistently good response times. And uh, I've been implementing this uh, model in the Go Ethereum Light Client Protocol, also called Elias, but uh, it's also applicable in any model uh, or any for any protocol, and it, uh, when this turns out to be workable, then it could also serve as a proof of concept for our future network protocols. So what I was trying to realize is a uh, truly decentralized uh, service cloud uh, where uh, clients and uh, servers can do resource allocation and uh, load balancing based purely on uh, market signals and can uh, take care of their own interests and protect themselves against attackers, attackers and frauds because uh, no one else will do this for them. And uh, uh, so uh, one of the, one, uh, the most obvious uh, issues such a system has to solve is that uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, uh, promises are not enforceable. So anyone can get away uh, at any point, including servers, right after receiving the payment. So we get to have some kind of a reputation mechanism, and uh, in this case, in this model, uh, this will look like uh, so servers have to first uh, provide the free service, and after uh, there's a high demand for the free service, and try, clients trust to try to trust the server, they can uh, start uh, offering uh, money in order to uh, priority. I also wanted this model to have, uh, of course, a low uh, network uh, uh, overhead. Uh, and ideally, it could even be workable uh, with uh, any kind of payment technology, including on-chain payments, but of course uh, with a more advanced payment channel technology. Payment channel technology. So uh, the best way to uh, uh, understand this uh, approach is uh, through the time factor. Timing is a key on any market, uh, and this one is no exception. After all, I promised you light and trust light clients and talked uh, talk about the importance of your response, quick response times. But also the market mechanisms themselves are uh, time dependent and uh, what uh, works on a uh, longer time scale might not work equally well on a short term time scale simply because the information uh, that actors uh, are trying to base their decisions on might uh, need some uh, time to become uh, reliable uh, like uh, service quality and response time statistics uh, and uh, uh, serving difficulty measurements, these are very noisy things and we just uh, have to collect a certain amount of uh, data in order to be able to make good decisions and uh, I would like to run into problems similar to high frequency trading which I believe can really disconnect from any market fundamentals and disrupt any meaningful market activity by extreme price fluctuations so in this model, we would also like to avoid the quick price fluctuations because uh, so prices, I believe, are practically meaningless on a short enough time scale or price changes. And so uh, in order to make things a bit more uh, stable and, uh, and uh, predictable, uh, in this talk, I will uh, show you how uh, servers can uh, uh, plan ahead a little bit uh, with their uh, allocating uh, their serving capacity and how clients can uh, do load balancing based on uh, uh, server feedback and also on a longer time scale uh, how uh, clients can uh, uh, evaluate server performance and choose the best service uh, for their money. So for first, uh, let's uh, look at how the servers can uh, uh, manage their own uh, serving capacity and uh, ensure good response times. Uh, servers Oh, sorry. 
So uh, servers uh, have their own token accounting, uh, and uh, so they, they have their own service tokens, which uh, are meant to be based on uh, the actual physical serving difficulty of requests, and, uh, and completely, actually, they should be unrelated to any market uh, prices or conditions. And uh, the request uh, costs are always nominated in the service tokens. And uh, basically, usually, the servers uh, uh, can freely decide uh, the uh, cost of uh, any individual request. But there are uh, previously announced uh, maximum uh, uh, cost limits for each request type. And uh, we also define capacity as uh, service tokens uh, spendable per uh, time unit. And we assign a capacity to each client, which basically means uh, request rate limiting. And we also set an upper limit on the uh, total capacity of uh, all connected clients, and uh, this is uh, the, the goal of this is to uh, avoid the uh, transient overloads, with, by which I mean uh, a situation where we have a lot of requests uh, in the same time and the uh, response times start to uh, rise very quickly. And uh, so we, we uh, set up some criteria for detecting this, and uh, we can. Uh, uh, Maybe not always avoid this, but uh, reduce its uh, frequency of its occurrences by manually adjusting the total capacity uh, allotments. So the request rate limiting um, method of uh, applied in LES is called the client side for control. And as I said, uh, it's based on a, a <coughs> capacity to each uh, client and also a request cost buffer. And the server, when it receives a request, it uh, can uh, remove the cost of the request from the buffer and also recharge the buffer at a rate that's proportional to the capacity. And uh, in, in every uh, reply, uh, it also includes the current buffer, buffer uh, status. And uh, this is what the uh, clients can use as a feedback for load balancing because if they have multiple uh, uh, server connections, they can always send the next request uh, to the server where they, where they have the best uh, buffer value. And uh, yeah, now a few words about how uh, uh, service tokens are being sold. So, uh, so basically, we really want the servers to be able to. Uh, sell some of their tokens in advance, but not too many of them, because uh, the, uh, spending, the spending rate of uh, tokens is also limited, and uh, it is always the server's interest to uh, uh, ensure the stability of uh, the purchasing power of its own tokens, because as we will see later, there's, uh, the clients will pay attention to this, and, uh, and uh, the servers will lose their reputation if they fail to do so. So uh, what uh, servers should ideally do is uh, limit the total outstanding amount of its service tokens by uh, controlling the uh, selling price of tokens. So there's a base price and uh, as uh, it issues more and more tokens it can uh, rise up the token price. And if we are limiting the amount of tokens, we should also enforce uh, spending of the tokens by setting an expiration time on them or by making them inflationary or some combination of these. And it's also important to mention here that uh, whenever a currency transfer is uh, accepted by the server, it's not automatically converted to service tokens. That's something the client has to explicit explicitly initiate. And, uh, and this is also when the expiration starts ticking. So uh, it's uh, always optional to uh, buy a significant amount of service tokens in advance. That's an option for clients that has a potential cost, but it also has a benefit. One benefit is that it avoids uh, further price fluctuations, but even more importantly, that this is a commitment to spending the tokens and using the service in the near future. And uh, the server, this is a very valuable information for the server, and the server will reward this by granting uh, more stable connections. And <coughs> let's look at into the details of how it's done. So, uh, so uh, we are now looking into the uh, client connection priority model. Uh, the, so uh, obviously, uh, the number of uh, clients to be connected uh, simultaneously is limited. So we got, got to have some kind of priorities. And the priority value we are going to use in this model is a token balance divided by requested capacity. And, uh, uh, I'm not going to explain this in detail now, but uh, the nice property of this is that it rewards uh, commitment with commitment. So if the client commits to uh, use the service in the near future, then the server commits to let the client use the service in the near future. 
And another nice property of this is that uh, it lets uh, us integrate the free service very nicely and uh, smoothly into the whole model. Uh, and this is all something that already works in a Go Ethereum light servers uh, that uh, even clients who don't have a token balance, they have a, a virtual negative balance which is uh, associated to, to the IP address and uh, also uh, it's uh, expired exponentially over a longer, longer time. But uh, So this is uh, to ensure that uh, uh, free clients uh, uh, can, so, so, so the, 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 the client who has used the service less in the, in the recently can, has a higher uh, chance to connect. And uh, so free service is also important and the server also has to ensure that uh, free service is uh, regularly, not always, but regular, regularly available for two reasons. One of them is that this is what helps uh, reputation building and getting uh, new customers. And the other one is that the same condition that allows uh, uh, free service to be available, it also ensures that uh, the service defense are all spendable in a limited uh, time frame. So there's another control mechanism here that uh, uh, controls the base token price uh, based on whether the service free service is possible or not. If it is possible, then uh, it uh, uh, reduces the price and otherwise uh, uh, it uh, slowly, exponentially increases the base price. And uh, yeah, this is about it for the server mechanism. And now quickly let's take a look at the uh, client side uh, uh, mechanisms. So uh, this is a complex topic and then also, uh, also I can't uh, go into every little detail here, but uh, there's a subjective value uh, measurement on the client side, which is uh, ideally it should be a mirror of the uh, server side uh, token accounting. So basically the clients try to uh, somehow put a number on how much uh, service uh, they received and this is also based on served requests and uh, guaranteed capacities and it's also uh, modified by a service quality factor which is based on re response times and uh, how response times are uh, converted to server quality uh, depends on the uh, expectations on response times which uh, depends on uh, price factors and everything so basically it's possible to if, if, if uh, the client has to make a decision on who to pay for, it can map out the whole available market as a uh, price versus uh, average expected response time uh, function, which is nice and intuitive and un easy to understand for human users. So if we have an equilibrium and we have an expected response time, then we can uh, convert our collective statistics into a single scalar value. And I'd like to mention here that uh, the very long response times uh, can even map out as a negative uh, value uh, for clients because we want to incentivize uh, reliably good response times. And this service value is what uh, the clients are trying to get for their money, basically. And finally, uh, there's a tricky part of this because uh, if the client wants to make a decision uh, about uh, who to pay for, then what it really would like to do is uh, to predict the service value received uh, after making the payment and before the next uh, payment is requested. So, uh, so uh, theoretically, if they, we can trust the server, this is not so hard because uh, uh, we expect the service uh, tokens purchasing power to be more or less stable and the client has an idea of how valuable those service, service tokens were in the past and there's a token price at the moment. So uh, it should be predictable, but of course uh, the client cannot blindly trust any server. So this is how the reputation building mechanism works. Uh, we have three predictors. We have a base value predictor, which is a very simple and paranoid and uh, only uses uh, uh, things that uh, the client knows for sure. So it uh, basically takes the service value received so far and the payment sent so far and the payment expected uh, currently and it just does a linear extrapolation which is uh, which converges to something uh, meaningful over the long term. It's not very good, but uh, also not cheatable. And there's the trusted value predictor, which uh, basically does, does what I already described. It believes the server and its token accounting and token prices and the stability of these tokens. And uh, to make the final judgment, there's a third ensemble predictor, which uh, 
but initially takes uh, uh, returns the predictions of the base predictor, and uh, over time, if the trusted predictor consistently gives better estimates of service value received after making a payment, then it will allow more and more deviation from the base base uh, predictor's value in the direction of the trusted pre predictor's uh, prediction, and uh, so this is this this. Uh, this uh, allowed deviation, this represents the reputation of the server and this is what is going to be ruined if the server doesn't uh, hold its promises and doesn't keep its uh, service token value stable. And uh, yeah, I have a little more time, so uh, now just, uh, just, just uh, about a few words about current state of implementation and uh, uh, with the roadmap. So, uh, as I, as I already said, most of the, most of the components, uh, or many of the components, are already implemented in GoEthereum, and uh, I, uh, so far, mostly focused on implementing the server side, because that's uh, what uh, first, uh, uh, that's what we first need in order to even start uh, ex experimenting, and uh, recently, uh, a an, uh, uh, server API has been implemented uh, it's going to come out in one of the uh, subsequent get releases, and uh, this, with this you can already uh, play with the uh, with, uh, client priorities, and you can assign uh, priorities to your own uh, nodes, or your friends, or customers' nodes. And uh, there's the automatic token sale mechanism. Uh, it's work in progress, but uh, I really hope I can uh, finish it, and we can uh, release it uh, end of, by the end of this year. And this will mean that by the end of this year, we are going to have a, a payment, fully working payment enabled light servers, and uh, and uh, which anyone can start up and start earning money. Uh, and uh, this this still means that the, on the client side, uh, uh, there's going to be some manual help needed, like a whitelist for servers uh, who we can pay for. But uh, the client side, uh, client side uh, management logic, it's also uh, already partially implemented, and I really hope that uh, uh, by the middle of next year, we are going, to, I am going to be able to show some uh, some uh, results that you can try. Uh, of course, this is going to be an ongoing, long uh, research, and uh, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, Please, uh, please, please, uh, give, if you if you have any feedback, uh, uh, then uh, contact me. I'm going to uh, release uh, new docu documents about the details of this model because I'm aware of it that I, <laughs> I didn't answer any every kind of questions in this short talk. But uh, I'm going to put up uh, put up the new documents to my GitHub page, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, announce them on Twitter and Reddit and everywhere. And uh, I would really like to uh, make this model usable both for uh, for Go Ethereum and the Get Light client, and also for uh, uh, our future Light clients of Ethereum too. And yeah, that was it. Thank you for your attention. So maybe there's time for one question or two. Any questions? <coughs> How do payments work? Sorry? How do payments work? Oh, how do payments work? Well, uh, so this, this, this model uh, is... Uh, so it can work with, 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 with any kind of payment technologies. Uh, I was uh, uh, looking into using uh, uh, Raiden, uh, and now the Swarm team also has uh, the SWAP protocol that's also a... a an interesting payment channel technology, but uh, I think we can even start experimenting, as I said, with simple on-chain uh, payments, which are really easy to do. And uh, yeah, so 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 the model doesn't depend on the payment the payment technology. Are, are the tokens fungible? You can pay for a token or a user or just service to consuming? Uh, no, so, so every server has its own service token and they are only accounted locally on the server. And I'm not sure yet whether they should be uh, tradable or transferable. That's, uh, well, that's, that's, let's, let's leave it as a future research topic, whether that's a good idea or not. So if you do like an on-train transaction, you have to um, like free pay and hope that they're like... <coughs> 
Yeah, so uh, the server uh, will, so if you send ether to a server or die or whatever, what the server wants to accept, the, then you are going to have ether or die on the server. And uh, uh, as I said, you have to explicitly say, okay, now I, I have ether with you and I want to convert uh, some of it to service to hands now. And uh, my time is up and thank you very much.